Good morning and welcome to the 33rd meeting of the committee in 2014. Uh, everyone present is asked to switch off mobile phones and other electronic equipment as they affect the broadcasting system. Uh, some committee members will use uh, tablets during the course of the meeting, uh, and that's because we provide meeting papers in a digital format. Agenda item uh, one today um, is uh, public petition PE01538 uh, on the 25th of November 2014, the Public Petitions Committee referred Petition PE01538 by Dr Richard Burton and Peter Stuart Blacker on behalf of Accountability Scotland to this committee. This petition calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to amend the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman Act 2002 to ensure that complainants are shown all correspondence between SPSO and the bodies complained about before the investigation is, is concluded. That includes emails and that they are also made aware of the content of any verbal communications. Uh, members have the clerk's note uh, and links to the petition and the official report uh, of the petitions uh, committee. Uh, do members have any views? Uh, the committee is invited whether to consider in the first instance this petition as part of its scrutiny uh, of the 2013-14 SPSO annual report at its meeting on 7th January 2014 and in preparation for that meeting to invite the SPSO to submit to the committee written comment on the petition. Are we agreed that that's the way forward? Thank you very much. Agenda item two um, is an oral evidence session, our third oral evidence session, on the Air Weapons and Licensing Scotland Bill. Uh, we have one panel of witnesses this morning discussing the alcohol licensing provisions in the bill. Uh, before I introduce today's witnesses, uh, I would like to clarify the committee's approach to who we ask to appear before us and the general criteria we adopt. This is directed towards those from the public sector, including local authorities in particular, although for others our approach is similar. Uh, when deciding who to invite, we look to achieve a balance from across the country, covering both rural and urban. We also have in mind coverage from affluent and less affluent areas. We aim to spread the coverage across the whole country while recognising those in the larger urban areas might have more experience and knowledge of particular issues to share with us. We also recognise staff in the larger urban areas can be more specialised and potentially handle a wider variety of issues, but we are always looking to uh, what the impact is on uh, smaller areas too. Uh, we consider written su submissions and other pertinent information before selecting witnesses, and we are always interested to hear from those who provide an opinion which may differ from the status quo. Where we receive submissions providing similar opinions, we will try to avoid duplication in our panels and will also strive to have contrary views available to test what we are being told. We expect when we issue an invitation uh, for witnesses to attend. Only in exceptional circumstances will we cancel an inv invitation. These invitations are not like invites to attend government working groups or other such uh, working groups, and we do not consider acceptance to be discretionary. We do have powers to compel. We don't want to use them, as we appreciate it is far better all round that people attend willingly. If witnesses feel they are not the appropriate person to attend, they should contact the clerk immediately, which will allow an opportunity to discuss and see if there might be a better alternative. If witnesses leave it to the last minute to contact the clerks, they will not be allowed to withdraw and we will expect them to attend. Um, I'd like to welcome today's panel who have accepted our invitation to appear, appear in front of us. They are John Lee, Public Affairs Manager of the Scottish Grocers Federation, Stephen McGowan, Head of Licensing at the Institute of Licensing, and Paul Watterson, Chief Executive of the Scottish Licence Trade Association. Welcome, gentlemen, and good morning. Do you have any opening remarks that you'd like to make to the committee? Good morning. No. Who's going to go first? Mr Lee? I'd just like to say, convener, um, STF is the National Trade Association for the convenience store industry in Scotland. There are about 5,500 convenience stores in Scotland. STF wouldn't claim to represent all of them. But nevertheless, there are a high density of convenience stores in Scotland relative to the rest of the UK. 
convenience stores are embedded in every community in Scotland, every city, town, in our um, rural and urban communities. Um, alcohol is an important category for our members. Um, in addition to that, um, SGF is an active member of the Scottish Government Alcohol Industry Partnership. Uh, SGF sits on the Glasgow Licensing Forum and the Edinburgh Licensing Forum. And um, we are also very active participants in something called the East Edinburgh Community Alcohol Partnership. So um, alcohol is an important issue for our members. Um, our response to the committee's written evidence focused mainly on the issue of overprovision, And I'd be very happy to answer any questions on that um, this morning. And I'll just finish by thanking the committee very much for the invitation today. Thank you, Mr Lee. Mr Watterson, please. Yeah, Scottish Licensed Trade Association was formed in 1880. Um, we represent the independent trade in Scotland. Um, our members run our nations, pubs, bars, hotels. We also have some members in the off-sales sector. We have um, late opening premises as well. And um, we're delighted to be here today to give, our, to give you our views. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr McGowan, please. Good morning, convener. Um, I'm here today to represent uh, the Institute of Licensing uh, Committee members. The Institute of Licensing is an umbrella organisation which represents licensing practitioners across the United Kingdom. Licensing practitioners drawn from private practice, drawn from local authorities and also from police authorities. So it's an organisation which is uh, representative of um, many stakeholders involved in the day-to-day -day, um, administration of uh, licensing uh, systems uh, across the UK and in Scotland. Um, individually, I'm a solicitor in private practice and I appear uh, on behalf of the licensed trade at licensing boards across Scotland. And in respect of the Institute's submission to this uh, committee, um, there are, I suppose, three particular points which uh, we had sought to raise uh, for your attention, um, all of which are technical issues as opposed to some of the larger issues, but nonetheless issues which we as practitioners feel are incredibly important. Uh, one of these is the existing provisions for transfer of licences under the alcohol licensing regime, which uh, I think every single licensing practitioner in Scotland would agree requires updating, and I'll hopefully address you on that later. The second uh, uh, key point which we hope to get across today is the position in relation to provisional alcohol licences um, under the system. This is a, a licence which would be sought where there is no uh, building or where the building is under construction, and there are difficulties on the ground, if I can use that phrase, uh, with the existing uh, system. And then finally, uh, there's an issue over the status of licences where they have been surrendered. The Act doesn't treat or deal with the surrender of licences particularly well in our submission. And again, we would like to address you uh, on that particular point. Uh, the final point I wish to make in opening submission is that I would like to address you in relation to the fit and proper test uh, and the reintroduction of that and some issues which the Institute sees surrounding the use of police intelligence and surrounding the reference to the reintroduction of the consideration of spent convictions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if I could first of all start on the subject of uh, over-provision, which Mr Lee and Mr Watterson have mentioned. Um, and I, I was quite surprised, I have to say, in terms of previous discussions that I've had with uh, members of the bodies that you represent, that there are real concerns in some quarters about over-provision. Um, can I ask you, um, uh, Mr Lee, first of all, um, what uh, your current experience and your members' current experience is of how licensing authorities deal with their duty to assess over-provision? Thanks, Convener. Um, I think uh, under the, the 2005 Act, all licensing boards have to have some kind of uh, regard to over-provision uh, within the statement of licensing policy. Um, in terms of the proposals under the new Act, it seemed to us that licensing boards were being at least encouraged to look at the entire board's geographical area as a, a, pretend, a potential area for, for, for over-provision. 
We felt that that was something which could potentially um, inhibit trade and potentially be anti-competitive, um, particularly for our more independent members, to the extent that even if you were trying to refit your store and increase the size of your alcohol sales area, um, that it could be uh, an inhibitor uh, for those type of expansion and, and investment plans. I think um, there's different views on boards on the idea of, 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 of over-provision. Um, I think there's been a lot of focus recently on um, arguments that it's the number of outlets, the number of alcohol outlets that are responsible for alcohol-related harm. Uh, we feel that that's a very misguided approach. Uh, I genuinely feel that there's not sufficient evidence um, to say that it's the, the, the number of outlets that, that causes harm. So there's a number of issues um, run about over-provision which, which causes some um, concern at the moment. Uh, overall, I think boards have to judge every case on its merits uh, and look at a licence application and consider whether or not the grounds for the licence have been made and then either grant it or, or, or refuse it on that basis. So we don't think a, a blanket approach to, to over-provision would be particularly helpful. You mentioned in your answer there, um, if a retailer was going to expand the area um, that they sell alcohol from, um, and it was suggested during one of the initial panels that we held that you, know, you could have a wee shelf with uh, some alcohol on it, um, and continue to replenish that shelf from a huge storeroom out the back. So how do we judge in terms of the retail space compared to the storage space uh, in terms of defining over-provision? Uh, certainly, in, um, in my experience of um, the Edinburgh Licensing Board convener, uh, at the moment they ask for... Uh, applicants have to um, state in their operating plan and in their layout plan the the size of their alcohol sales area in, in linear metres. Our concern was that if we really start to drill down into the issue of over-provision uh, and what will make an area an area of over-provision, then uh, the overall um, metreage of alcohol sales area could, could come into play. So you could almost put a cap on the, the sales area in, in a particular area and say you can't you can't increase it at all. And so if, um, if for some reason, um, because of a short refit or changing customer needs, a retailer wanted to expand their alcohol sales area, they may be prevented from doing that because of, of a particularly um, strict over-provision policy. But the licensing board, do you think they should take into account the storage area? Because in some regards, it doesn't matter what the shelf area is, it's how you manage to keep that shelf stocked. Indeed, but that, it's only that shelf area that will be open to the public. That's the only that will determine the amount of alcohol that's on display as on on sale at any, any given time. Um, but do, but do you if, think that logically the storage area should also be taken into account? Then I don't see why that would how that would be helpful particularly. Okay. Uh, there's also been discussions within Edinburgh about whether or not the um, amount of alcohol the volume of alcohol that an applicant expects to sell should be included in their application. And again, I really don't see what utility that would bring. That would be quite difficult to define, one would indeed, imagine, indeed. particularly for uh, a new premise. Uh, <coughs> Mr Watterson, I had the pleasure a number of years back of talking to your members at their AGM in, in Aberdeen and was surprised that a lot of the offline chat was about over-provision and concerns yeah. from your members about, uh, about it. What, what do you feel about the, the current set of circumstances with licensing boards? Well, this is an argument that's been raging since before the 1976 Act, back to the, the days of Clayson Report. And our, our, um, our position hasn't changed since then. Over-provision is included in the Act, which means it's a grounds for refusal. It's recognised in principle. So how do we make it work? And we've heard, we've heard the detail this morning of should you take this into consideration, should you take that into consideration, and all these controversial all, all these controversial items come up from time to time. We've had some boards recently, well, 2010, for instance, Western Bartonshire, come up with an approach 
which we thought was novel. It took into account a whole range of factors and decided that their whole area was overprovided. Then, due to board changes, that fell apart. So all the work that we all did in the Western Bartonshire situation with others fell apart. We've seen controversy in Edinburgh where board changes or, or political attitudes or whatever um, after Edinburgh deciding that off licences would be refused. We've seen the controversy there. So how do we, without going into all these details and all, all the arguments that, that rage about it, our position has always been there should be a freeze on the numbers. So numbers would be frozen. It wouldn't stop development because um, licences would be transferred within the system. So there's plenty of room for development of, of new premises. If you wanted to open a premises, you would have to have um, licences to value, same and similar kind, so square footage, you would have to have that amount of licences and so on. So it doesn't stop development, it actually helps development, it gives confidence into development. Remembering that over-provision is in the Act, so it's up to us to try and make it work. And that's the only way we can see it working. It happens in Northern Ireland with some success. Um, and you know, what can be worse for development of our trade than um, the whole liquor licence and sales in Scotland being controlled by five or six operators? If that doesn't stop development, I don't know what does. And how do we try and, how do we try and get some balance back in to the market in Scotland? Because the ultimate, the ultimate situation with over-provision is that you get over-competition, and it's over-competition that's responsible for the downward pressure on price, which creates the problems that we've had to, to try and implement minimum unit pricing, which our government's decided to have. So if minimum unit pricing is a short-term answer to this cut pricing and a general race to the bottom and a deterioration in standards, then over-provision is a long-term answer to that. And we want, a, we want a trade that's based on quality of premises, not on quantity. The committee have received a, a petition uh, which we are looking at as part of our um, scrutiny of the Community Empowerment Bill um, about the major supermarket chains um, taking over smaller premises and high streets, the express kind of stores, without naming the actual supermarket. Are these the kind of uh, businesses, bodies, that you think are taking over the market? Well, it's the blitzkrieg their way through supermarkets, and uh, um, I don't, certainly don't speak for convenience stores, but through time, these sites and we've seen it happening in, in Edinburgh, the best sites will be snapped up by the big operators and we'll lose independent operators. It's the same in the on-trade. And I certainly don't want to lose independent operators because that gives people choice. And independent operators will be left with the scraps. They'll be forced further and further out of the... And we'll end up, as we have already, with five or six operators dominating the alcohol market in Scotland. Scotland is dominated. I mean, the figures are there to prove it. And I don't think that's good for competition. I don't think it's good in any sense. So we've got to try, and I think legislation's there, in licensing to redress that balance. And if we want to make over-provision work, and there's a host of arguments for and against, you know, the implementation of it. It is a numbers game, and it should be a numbers game. And I stress, within those numbers, Licences can be transferred. Development can still take place. I think there's this... People don't understand that. When they, when they see the numbers frozen, they think you can never get a new opening. You can never transfer licences within the system. That's not right. And that'll help development, not stop it. Thank you. Before I bring in Mr McGowan, Mr Lee, would you like to comment on, uh, <coughs> on these operators coming into the high street? The Thanks, Kimura. Yes, I'm aware of the petition uh, that you <laughs> mentioned. And the fact is that our members are under severe pressure from the organisation that's named in the petition and from other big operators like them. Uh, and I'm not here to defend them or, or speak up on their behalf, and uh, I don't even want to do them a favour. However, um, we think that each application has to be judged on its merits, regardless of who it comes from. We don't think we can be anti-competitive or anti-trade. So really, the, the focus for 
any licensing board has to be able to judge an individual application on its merits, regardless of, of who it comes from. Thank you. Mr McGowan, on that over-provision situation. I certainly would endorse the, uh, the point that uh, each application should be on its own merits, and that's long been the case and should certainly continue to be so. Um, the Institute's response in relation to over-provision focuses on uh, the aspect of introducing licensed hours in terms of over-provision, which is in Clause uh, 54 of the proposed bill. <clears throat> Our comment to the committee on this would be that there is an a ongoing issue over a concept known as the duty to trade. The duty to trade in short compass uh, says that a licensed premises must be open throughout its licensed hours, a duty to remain open during the hours that are granted. This concept is um, one which very few licensing practitioners agree with. The vast majority, if not a full majority of licensing practitioners, both in private and from local authority practice, I do believe that there is no duty to trade. And therefore, my comment to the Committee on Overprovision would be to note that if licensed hours are to be a factor of overprovision, it would be helpful if the law confirmed that there was no duty for a licensee to have to open through all of the hours in his or her licence. The wording um, which refers to this used to exist in the 76 Act. There was a specific section in that Act which said a licensee does not have to trade theirs in his licence. That wording was not carried through to the 2005 Act, and the Institute would very much like to see that wording be reintroduced if, uh, if Clause 54 is to be enacted in relation to licensed hours. And that's my submission on over provision. Thank you. Uh, on the licensing hours issue and the proposal within the, the bill to um, include licensed hours as part of the over-provision assessment, do you have any comments on that, Mr Watterson? It's just another point of detail that's got to be taken into account. And we'll have, we'll, the, the argument will rage about that too. You know, part-time, people opening part-time. Um, are people open that they, are they opening all the hours that they say they're opening? It just goes into the detail even more and makes board's, board's job far more difficult. Mr Lee? No real desire to see the, um, the hours extended or anything like that can be no. Thank you very much. Cameron Buchanan, please. Thank you. Good morning, panel. I just wanted to take up the point about occasional licences and members, members clubs. You know, how, do you, how do you regulate these sort of occasional licences and private clubs? And do you think they should be regulated in the same sort of way? Mr McGowan? Um, the position under the 2005 Act is that a voluntary organisation can apply for an occasional licence for its premises. And the, the effect of that is, is to allow the public in. Now, under normal circumstances, a licensed club premises would have members, and members of the public could be signed in as guests of those members. So the occasional licence route uh, circum circumvents that and allows members of the public access to those premises. Uh, we are aware uh, of issues across various licensing authorities in Scotland uh, who have concerns over the regulation of club premises. The Act, the 2005 Act, is existing, um, provides various exemptions to certain aspects of the Licensing Act for club premises, one of which is that they don't have to name a premises manager in the same way that bars and off-sales do. Um, there have been concerns raised by some licensing authorities in Scotland that clubs are not as well regulated as public access premises, such as pubs, bars uh, and off-sales. Um, and it would be a matter of policy for the Scottish Parliament to decide whether or not further regulation was merited for clubs. Mr Watterson, do you have a view on that? Yeah, I mean, another, another problem that we thought would be attended to in the 2005 Act wasn't. Clubs were registered in the old Act. Clubs were registered under the Sheriff. There was no police entry to clubs, which we thought wasn't a good situation. We knew there was some problems. Some clubs are very well run, but so, some definitely aren't. Under the 2005 Act, being licensed, we thought that would be that would be the beginning of the end of badly run clubs, but um, because we would get police entry into them. But they didn't take into account the constitutions of the clubs. So many clubs just simply run as pubs, with all with all the advantages they have as re, as registered clubs. So um, it's a ridiculous situation where they're competing now as pubs. In fact, in some cases. 
part of them are, are licensed and part of them are still the club and the club people can't get in because the public are in. You know, it's just, you know, the original reason they were formed, those people can't, can't even get into them. So it's a, it's a very difficult situation for us to take the public being allowed into these clubs on numerous occasions throughout the year. So we would like to see these, these um, loopholes in the law filled and, and some, some uh, registered clubs continuing to be what they were meant to be for the, for, the, for the members of the clubs and not the general public, and they're making money from that. Thank you. Mr Lee, that's a bit out of your sphere, but do you have any comment? I have no knowledge of clubs, I'm afraid, can you know? Thank you. Cameron? Excuse me. Do you think it's giving them an unfair business advantage, then? An unfair business advantage to start with, because they don't pay rates the way normal premises. There's, there's, there's other advantages that they have. So the, the, the whole basis is that it's unfair to start with. If you then say to them, you can, you can have these occasional licences throughout the year and the public are allowed in, they become big businesses. Now, some clubs are very well run. There's, there's no doubt about that. But some definitely bend, bend the rules and it's an unfair situation. So should we be bringing all this together, do you think? Well, we should certainly be take, going back to when the, 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 the Constitution was taken into account and um, members had to sign people in and, and the other rules mm. and regulations allied to the fact they're now licensed, I think would close a lot of that. But the Constitution must be part of the licence. So the Constitution must get taken into account. And they shouldn't just be allowed to trade with, with these occasional licences consistently till it becomes their main business. The, the main reason that they're there is to make money. Mr McGowan. It's just a, a point of clarification I think might be useful. That under the current Act, there is a limit on the number of occasional licences that can be sought by a club premises, which is up to a maximum of 56 days in a calendar year. There, there is a bit more to it than that, but that's the... the Did you say per, per club, yes. Per club, thank you. There, there is a wee bit more to it than that, but for the purpose of today, 56 days in a calendar year is the, the maximum. But the other point I think would be useful for committee members to note is that there has been a number of club premises who have varied their licence to make them effectively a full pub public access premises, mm. albeit they might still have a constitution and still, on the face of it, might appear to be a members' club. Because they have changed the conditions of their licence, they are allowed full public access. And there are a number of premises in Edinburgh and across the whole country where uh, club premises historically uh, have uh, uh, been based on members and bona fide guests. But because they've had their licence varied, they are now allowed public access without any of those rules applying. Thank you. Thank you. That's fine. Thank you. John Wilson, please. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Just to go back to some of the questioning the Convener started with this morning, and that's the issue about licensing boards being able to define the whole local authority area in relation to over-provision. Do you think that is adequate or do you think it goes too far? Because when you think of, say, the Highlands, and if Highlands make a decision uh, based on over-provision in Inverness, how that impacts on other towns and villages around the Highlands may actually uh, stop anyone opening up, a, say, a small retail outlet in Wick or Thurso. What would be the panel's view on that issue about the whole local authority area being defined for over-provision? Mr Lee, first, please. Uh, thanks, Mr Wilson. It's a very good question, and I think your point about uh, a very large um, local authority area like, like, like Highland is, is a very opposite one. Um, we, we feel that it is, it is going too far. Um, we think um, a locality approach should, should always be taken uh, down to local, local data zone level. Uh, and again, looking at the application on, it, on its merits, taking into consideration um, any points, any comments, any objections from the police, uh, health agencies and so on. Um, so we really think that a kind of blanket approach to over-provision, taking the whole geographical area, really is, really is a step too far. And um, we wouldn't encourage uh, boards to be encouraged to do so uh, under, the new, under the new Licensing Act. Um, but as you say, I mean, it would, be, it would have a knock-on effect in an area such as Highland if the main um, target was a, a, a busy urban area like, like Inverness. It could have a knock-on effect on um, local independent convenience stores in, in, in rural areas, which are very important uh, to those areas. So 
Yeah, put it, to put it simply, yeah, we think it is a step too far. Mr Watterson, please. Of course, we want the area to be the whole of Scotland. <laughs> so so you, you know our answer to that. I think licensing boards are in a very difficult position in this. If a licensing board was to say their whole area, which, I'll, which we believe they could have done that anyway, um, if, for instance, um, a development was to take, try to get a licence in that area, but decided to move into the next area, it could cause a, a you know, it could cause a problem for them, with 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 their constituents and so on. So, you know, simply moving the licensing around because one area has a less lax over provision policy is not a good situation for boards to be in. They worry about that. They're also under great pressure from from the bigger from the bigger operators. I think um, there's certainly a two tier decision-making system going on with licensing boards and over-provision. And what I mean by that is they're, they're, they're very worried about the financial problems with, if they're appealed. So they know that the, the bigger companies will appeal. Perhaps the independent trade don't have the finance to appeal. So they will look upon the bigger developments uh, more favourably than, than others. So, again, this whole question about what the area should be becomes part of the argument. There's, you know, and we'll hear, we'll, we've heard the other side of the argument here. So there is only one way to sort that out, is to make the whole country um, with no boundaries. Again, stressing that um, within the system, licences can be transferred to different areas within the system. Just to expand on that, Mr Watterson, you're basically saying as far as you're concerned, you'd like the whole of Scotland to be categorised in terms of over-provision. So, in a situation where, say, for example, Glasgow or Edinburgh, two major cities have a lot of bars, a lot of uh, off-licences within the city centres, how does that work out as a, the example I used in terms of Thurso or Wick, when somebody applies for a licence? And based on your analogy, then the, because of the over-provision in Edinburgh or Glasgow, somebody may be denied an off-sales licence in WIC. Well, it's interesting in rural areas because we've, we've had it, so many closures. And many villages in Scotland have now lost their pub. If licence was transferred within the system, then it would give confidence to people to go into those areas and open places because licences are transferred within the system. Just because you've got one or two good pubs in a village doesn't mean to say you'll have three. You can have three bad ones then because the market's split up and we've seen the three close. So it can actually be managed so that places like that have lost their pubs could actually get them back. And I think we all know that when, when a village or somewhere, a community loses the pub, they lose their they can lose their meeting place, their, their heart. And I think with having the numbers, that can be managed a lot better. Because we know, I mean, if you go into Glasgow or Edinburgh, the circuits of pubs, which are bigger and bigger and bigger, you know, it's not just the numbers now, it's the capacity of them. You know, there are enough. I don't think anybody could, because over-provision is agreed. It's how we do it. And that's why we think, to take all the controversy away, the numbers... The numbers, um, the numbers system works. It works in Northern Ireland. I don't see any problem with development of pubs in Northern Ireland. There's a good spread of pubs in, in, in the north. It seems to work OK. I don't see the problem. And again, it's this over-competition consistently that pulls prices, prices down. Although we're seeing, although we're seeing um, a, a, a rate of closures, which probably proves the point anyway, um, the market can change. It can it can overheat again. That's happened. It's happened in it happened in the 80s and in the 90s. It went down again. There was closures and it's it, it grew again. So this constant this constant opening, more and more people opening, can create problems. Mr. McGowan. Yes, thank you, Convener. Um, <clears throat> first thing I would say is that the Institute's position is that the existing law does allow licensing boards to set their whole jurisdiction as an area of over-provision, notwithstanding that this bill seeks to allow that. 
Um, there was perhaps from one or two quarters uh, a concern that the existing terms of the Act didn't allow it, but the Institute's position is that the Act currently does allow it, then indeed there are examples. The Highland Board, for example, uh, has an over-provision area of the whole of the Highland Board area, but only for all sales premises where the display of alcohol is 40 metres squared or greater. That's a very good example of a local licensing board taking a very specific approach to over-provision. And if I can give you one other example in terms of how the, how the licensing boards are defining areas rather than going for the whole area, how they pick or choose areas within their locality. Glasgow is a good example to use uh, Mr Wilson's comment about cities. Uh, the Glasgow licensing board policy on over-provision is not based on where there are the most number of premises. It's based on where there is the most harm as a result of irresponsible sale or consumption of alcohol. So there are, from memory, eight or nine small areas within the city of Glasgow which are deemed to be overprovided, but they're based on evidence which pre was presented to the Glasgow Board uh, in relation to health harms and crime and disorder. So, for example, Sucky Hall Street is not an overprovision area, albeit it's a very busy part of Glasgow. So that's another local approach. And there are various other examples that I could give you from across, uh, uh, across Scotland. Mr Lee, you wanted to come back in. Sorry, John. Yeah, it was just to say, to follow up on Mr um, Wilson's question, convener, I think another problem with a blanket approach to over-provision is that it wouldn't necessarily take account of the different types of premises that we're uh, applying for, for a licence. For example, the figures that we quoted in our uh, written submission for Edinburgh, which, apologies, may, may be out of date now, Edinburgh has roughly 449 restaurants 428 bars and pubs, but only 243 licensed convenience stores. So uh, I really don't think the city is overprovided for in terms of the convenience store so it has. So a blanket policy and overprovision, I think, would not take into account the, the differences between different premises and what they're actually offering and the role that alcohol um, plays uh, in, in, in their business model. John? Just in relation to Mr McGowan's response, the, the issue is that in Quite rightly, he identified Sochi Hall Street isn't included in over provision in Glasgow, but there's five or seven localities where there is seen to be health issues with alcohol. Has there been any work done by the trade or by the licensing boards in terms of the type of alcohol being sold by off licenses? Because the problem looking at is the, the issue that we constantly get bombarded with is the cheap spirits and the tonic wine sales in particular areas, whereas traditionally the convenience store having an uh, an off licence was on the basis of if somebody wanted a bottle of wine with their meal, was the traditional attitude that an off licence in a convenience store would be granted. But has there been any work done in terms of monitoring the types of sales that are taking place in the off licence trade uh, and those, particularly in this, the areas that are seen to be suffering most from alcohol abuse. Mr McGowan. I think each board has dealt with this differently, uh, Mr Wilson, and some boards have dealt with it with greater evidence than others. Um, to come back to the Highland example, if you look at the Highland licensing policy and over provision, you will see that they took considerable evidence from various parties, including the NHS, Alcohol Focus Scotland and others, about the health-related issues in their area. And from memory, I think the Highland Board took the view that the um, issues that they experienced and were seeing in their area were more about off-sales than on-sales. And that's why they formed the view of setting an over-provision policy based on off-sales of large premises with large displays and did not set an over-provision policy in relation to on-sales. There are other examples in other areas, Eastern Bartonshire, Western Bartonshire, um, where evidence has been led by various stakeholders and licensing boards have responded to that. Um, some licensing boards have uh, uh, taken it upon themselves to go and investigate these matters, but I suspect that the vast majority are responding to the consultation responses that have been put before them in terms of their policy formulation. Mr Watterson? Yeah, uh, the best example, I think, is the Western Bartonshire example where they took all these factors into account, 2010 came up with a, which is one of the worst areas for alcohol abuse in the country. And it fell apart due to board changes. So it's not sustainable. 
all that work that was done, and it was done for the right reasons, and I thought that the approach was novel. It was, it was a fair approach, it seemed a workable approach, and it fell apart. And so you how think that we... was down to personnel change on the board itself that made that? Yeah, I, th I think that's right. Okay. You know, they, they, they have allowed a couple of licences to open. There's big operators that opened there. I think they were under pressure because one of the big operators said they would move to another licensing board area. And they, they believed they would lose those jobs. I would argue with that, but they believed it would create jobs and the electorate believed that. And I think they were under pressure. And that's what happens with, 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 in all these situations. People come along, it happened in Edinburgh, where they, they come to a decision and it's not sustainable. I think, you know, it's very difficult for us as a committee to look at individual areas which we're not aware of or the circumstances within those areas. So I think, do you think that there is any licensing board out there who have had a long-term strategic plan in regards to some of these issues I and mean, have stuck to that plan no matter what the personnel changes on the board may be? And is that the way that it should be done, to have that strategic plan, with, of course, some flexibility if required? My experience is no. You don't think some, some, some have had um, over-provision policies, but they're all, for, for one reason or another, they fall apart. OK. Um, Mr Lee, no. Just, <coughs> just to mention, convener, and I'm sure the committee may be aware of this, my understanding is that licen licensing board's statements of licensing policy last for three, for three years. So that's roughly the time, the time frame for their, their overall approach. Um, I'm not sure there'll be any utility really in extending extending that to four or, or five years, whatever, that's probably time enough, I, I, I would say. Okay. Alec, is it in this point? Yeah, just yeah. in this point. Okay, please. I, I, I had intended to come back in on Mr Watterson in terms of when you mentioned the two-tier licensing system and ask him to clarify that a bit more. But I think you perhaps have done when you talked about Western Barton and the idea of supermarket and jobs. And is, is, is that the problem? And how realistic is it there for to have this policy over provision if you know it's not going to be implemented, what kind of pressure is licensing boards on or how useful would it be Mr. to have Watson. such a policy? Well, we're not saying don't open supermarkets. We're saying they shouldn't be licensed. They can open what they want. Yeah. But we're talking about licensing here. So um, the argument about jobs, you know, will rage about supermarkets and the amount of jobs that they take off other places and but it puts boards under pressure when, when they have, you know, they, they, they've got all the resources behind these big companies and they can play the system for three years. If you're building a massive operation, three years isn't too long to wait to, to um, A, you know, exhaust the objections. So, for instance, in some areas um, where, where new licences on and off trade, have, uh, uh, people have objected to them. You play the system and one by one the objections fall apart as time takes over. So, and you can't blame people for that because simply the, the applicant withdraws the application and waits. So if you've got 50 objections, the second time it's lodged, there might only be 20, the third time it's lodged, there's 10, you keep withdrawing it and eventually people are exhausted because they've got to go to the boards and um, community councils and are thwarted in that. So they lose, they lose the objection process. But the reasons haven't changed why they are objecting. And usually now the objections are, are very valid. So the system's wrong in that respect. Should, should there be some kind of cooperation between licensing boards in, in these regards then? In what sense? Um, in the fact that, you know, if Western Bartonshire and um, one of the neighbouring authorities, say Glasgow, um, uh, should there not be some kind of agreement round about certain uh, of the licence provision in, in the areas of the boundary, if you like? Well, I always remember going to a licensing board many years ago when I asked them if they could copy another licensing board and they said to me, no, we always do the opposite of what they do. So there's not a lot of there's not okay. a lot of communication between boards, and in some cases, 
they could be in conflict with, with each other in terms of these jobs. So it might suit one, one area to say, well, we want that if they think there's more jobs in it. So there's conflict between boards, um, between some boards. But that, that so I don't think, and it's because of that that you've got to make the area wider. OK. Um, I, I'm going back into history now, but uh, you have a situation certainly in the city of Aberdeen where there are licensed premises in what one would have thought would have been quite strange places. Mm. Um, but they were built there basically because at that point they were out with the city boundary and the traveller's rule applied yeah. on Sundays in particular. Um, and obviously there was not a huge amount of cooperation at that point between, yeah. between boards. And your argument would be that there should be a Scotland-wide scenario so that these conflicts don't exist. Absolutely. Right? OK. Yeah. I mean, it, it, might, it might be Sorry. argued there's too many anyway. OK. You know, I know that Nicholson, that was when we, when we gave this to Nicholson Committee, Nicholson Committee said, which I didn't think was a very good argument, there's too many anyway. So what difference will it make? Well, you know, it would make a difference. Mr McGowan, you were about to come back in. Yes, yeah, just a couple of minor observations. On the, the point about policy periods and the three-year licensing policy, it is, of course, proposed in this bill that that would be increased to five years, which my understanding is uh, because local members of licensing boards sometimes felt hamstrung coming in following a local uh, council election with the policy of their predecessors and that perhaps the policy should be linked to council terms rather than triennially. So I think that... Uh, 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 perhaps is helpful. The other minor observation I wanted to make was in relation to Mr Rowley's comment about jobs and employment and licensing boards taking that into account. The Western Bartonshire uh, policy on this is quite clear that Western Bartonshire takes into account the health benefits of employment. That they, they looked at evidential studies which demonstrated that there were, there were health benefits as a result of employment. And their policy was amended in relation to overprovision to allow the board to take into account jobs and the employment, the health benefits that could be, bought, could be brought through the creation of jobs. So the Western Bartonshire Licensing Board has been quite specific on that particular point and is probably more advanced than uh, a number of the other licensing boards because they were one of the first to introduce that large overprovision policy that they did back in 2010. Thank you very much. Will I coffee, please? Thanks very much, convener, and good morning to you. Um, firstly, could you just clarify what you were saying there, Mr McGowan, about uh, lining up the licence term to the same period of term as the, the council term? So, supposing you were in the last year of the council, would you be suggesting that it's only granted for a year until the council? Mr well, the, McGowan, please. Well, the, the, the current position, uh, Mr Coffey, is that the, the licensing policies uh, are for three years, and, at the mo and because of the way the Act came into force, it was from 2010 to 2013, 2013 to 2016. My understanding is that the bill as proposed seeks to change that to a five-year term based on council term, so that when a new council comes in and a new board is established, that they effectively can rewrite their own policy at that point, rather than perhaps having a one- or two-year overhang of the policy of their predecessors. Um, that, I believe, is something which has been requested by the boards themselves through this process. OK. OK. Thanks for that. Um, it was to, to give you, Mr McGowan, in particular, an opportunity to tell us a wee bit about some of the issues that you raised at the beginning. You talked about transfers, and Mr Watterson talked about transfers, maybe the pros and cons associated with that. The issues relating to provisional licences where there isn't a building. And you also mentioned about the status of surrendered licences. Could you maybe tell us a wee bit more about what your concerns are here? Mr. McGowan. I'm very grateful for that opportunity, can I say, first of all, and I will endeavour to be as brief as possible. Um, I think unanimously transfers would be the number one, the number one uh, on the, the hit list of requests for licensing solicitors and practitioners for the Parliament to look at. And we have asked uh, the licensing uh, solicitors across the country, have asked the Parliament on a number of occasions to look at this. So I, I, I will ask for it again. Um, the position with transfers under the Act, that is someone coming in to take over an existing licensed premises, happens all the time. Um, n normally, it would be because the premises has been bought or sold or leased to a new tenant, but it can also happen through death of a licensee, the licensee perhaps being declared mentally incapable or becoming insolvent. So there are a number of different ways in which a license might have to be transferred. But the Act doesn't deal with it 
in, 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 a, in a correct manner. First of all, it completely ignores dissolution of companies, so there is no provision in the Act for what happens to a licence which is held where a company has been dissolved. And we're left scrabbling around, trying to come up with some sort of fix with the goodwill of licensing clerks to try and keep premises trading where these issues have, uh, have come around. Property transactions conveyancing. The Licensing Act does not take account of the reality of property transactions in Scotland and how they are done. There are issues with that uh, in terms of the ongoing operation of a premises and the, react, the, 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 the Licensing Act reacting to a simple case of a pub being bought and sold. Uh, and that happens ev almost every day, one, one could say, and yet the Act does not adequately deal with it. The other, the other point is that the Act does not allow for what I am going to call a deemed grant of a transfer. So, in other words, it does not allow someone to go in to trade straight away whilst there is a transfer pending in the background. Now, that is the case in England and Wales. The 2003 Licensing Act allows the incoming owner of the premises to go in and trade, having bought the, the premises or taken a lease prior to the grant, the full grant of the transfer. So, the Institute, and I, I hope I am correct in saying just about every other licensing solicitor that there is in Scotland would very much endorse uh, the Parliament to look south of the border and look at the provisions under the 2003 Act for transfers. Uh, I should say on this point that I know that the Law Society Licensing Subcommittee, of which I should say I am also a member, has offered to assist the Parliament with drafting in relation to this point. So I would certainly uh, uh, w wish you to take them up on their offer uh, for that point. Provisional licences, licences where there is not yet a building constructed or where it is under construction. Under the old 1976 Act, there was a process called a site-only provisional, which would allow you to lodge a new licence application for a premises which had not yet been built or constructed, but without having to put in full detailed plans. Now, the current system what we have in the 2005 Act does not allow that, and the Institute and other practitioners would like to see us go back to the 1976 position, where an applicant would be able to put in what was known as a site-only application. Now, the difficulties with this and why it is being asked for is that it is very hard to produce an architect's drawing for a premises which might be three years off being built. It is very hard to present a full application on those terms. Can I stop you there? Is there a conflict here with um, planning legislation? Because, obviously, um, a licensing board uh, might find it difficult to grant a licence for a building that had not yet been given planning approval. Um, and it may be seen by the general public uh, as being a fait accompli uh, of planning for a licence premises being given the go-ahead if a licence has already been granted. Planning would always be the predecessor. And what I'm proposing to you this morning is not to move away from that. The Act currently requires, before you can even lodge a, an application for a liquor licence, that planning is in place. This proposal for a site-only application would not negate that. Planning permission would still have to be in place. It's just that the full level of where the bar will be, where, where the seating will be, would not need to be demonstrated at that very, very early point. And why this is needed is because it puts off investment. A number of developments are based on capital ventures, loans from banks, etc. And that funding very often can't be secured unless the parties know that there's going to be a licence in place. So at these early stages in developments where um, planning is in place, but the full details of the premises layout is not yet known, it's very difficult for those, for those developments to proceed because they don't have the certainty of knowing that a licence will be in place. So that commercial certainty would be greatly useful. And uh, if the Parliament could consider reintroducing that site-only style application, uh, that would be very useful. Happy to give any ancillary points on that by written submission, if that would help the, the committee. Uh, and then finally, and thank you for your indulgence, on surrenders of licences. Um, the issue here is that the Act, in, in, in the Institute's view, does not deal with surrenders of licences particularly well. It allows a licence to be surrendered, but the problem is it does not say what the status of that licence is thereafter. Does the licence exist? Does it not exist? Is it in the ether somewhere? So there is a problem with that. 
And the problem is where a licence is surrendered, sometimes that's for very legitimate reasons and it's because a premises no longer wishes to trade and that's accepted. But there are also examples of licences being surrendered out of spite. If you consider a situation where you have a landlord and a tenant and the landlord, the owner of the premises, has allowed his tenant to hold the licence, they fall out, rent hasn't been paid, whatever the case might be, the tenant out of spite surrenders the licence and the landlord is left with a pub with no licence which is not the best situation for that landlord to be in. So the Institute and other licensing practitioners would like the Parliament to redress this in some way by dealing one way or the other with what happens to a licence after it's been surrendered. Either say it's gone for good and that's it, in which case we know that that's the case, or allow the licence to be restarted in some way, perhaps by transferring it to back to the landlord or to another party. Under the 1976 Act, there was no specific provision for surrender, albeit that some parties did write to the licensing board and say, I've surrendered this licence. But those licences could be retrieved by way of a transfer. We can't do that under the 2005 Act because there is that specific surrender provision which didn't exist before. So one way or the other, we would like to have that cleared up. Either the licence is gone and that's it, or allow the license, the, the, the affected landlord or whoever to reactivate the licence, perhaps by way of a transfer application. Thank you for your time on that. Can I take John in just a second? Um, uh, just, Willie, to, just, for, just for clarification, Mr McGowan, because included in the legislation is the issue about the fit and proper person. Uh, now, I'm not saying there are landlords out there who aren't fit and proper persons, but if the licence holder is carrying out the trade then decides to surrender, then it does raise concern for me anyway that if you're saying the licence should be held or transferred to the landlord, and there's also other issues that you've mentioned about the application of, of licences uh, and determination of whether or not a transfer can take place on sale or surrender of the licence premises to someone who may not be deemed as of being a fit and proper person by the board. So what safeguards would you want to see put in the legislation to ensure that on the scenario you gave, where a licence holder decides through spite to give up that licence, to surrender that licence, to ensure that the landlord that the board may decide or be asked to transfer that licence to is a fit and proper person to actually hold that licence or retain that licence? Because there is, there is a a conflict, I think, in terms of trying to make sure that we have a fit and proper person test in amongst that. And as I said, we might have a scenario where a landlord may not be deemed fit and proper, and that's why they don't hold the licence to those premises. Mr McGowan. Um, the uh, Institute uh, certainly supports the proposal to reintroduce the fit and proper test, and, and I think um, most people in this system do support the fit and proper test being reintroduced. Um, I've got some separate comments about that in relation to police intelligence, but I'll perhaps leave that for the moment, and, and if, if, I, if there's a chance later, I can speak about that. So the reintroduction of the fit and proper test we support, and that would certainly go some way to address the concern that you raised. But there are existing safeguards in the system, uh, Mr Wilson. Any transfer application that's lodged is capable of, of, of being refused, first of all, by a licensing board. And it's also capable of being objected to by Police Scotland. Every single transfer that's lodged is reported on by the police. The police always send a report every single time a transfer is lodged. And the police will say, this person has no convictions and we don't object. Or they will say, this person does have convictions and therefore we do object. But they can also say, even where there are no, objection, eh, no convictions, the police can still object to the transfer of the licence. This is the existing law where they believe the licensing objectives would be prejudiced by the grant of that transfer. So there are existing safeguards in the system already. The fit and proper test will supplement that. OK, will I please? Sorry. But just to briefly come back in on the, the issue about s surrender. Were you, saying, were you saying there that it's possible, circumstances are possible where licences can be lost permanently because of that? process or do they get recycled within the system and transferred? Is it possible that they're lost? Uh, yes. Um, the, the Act has this phrase, uh, uh, it ceases to have effect, and this is part of the issue here. 
is that the Act doesn't define what that actually means, and there is a debate amongst licensing pr practitioners about whether this phrase ceases to have effect means it's gone forever, or whether it means it's somewhere in the ether and can be reactivated. So, and, the, and the solution to that would be what? Well, it would be one or the other. It's <coughs> probably a matter for the Parliament in terms of policy, but you either decide it is gone or you decide it can be reactivated, but let's have a decision one way or the other. I think that the practitioner's preference would be to allow a licence to be reactivated by way of a transfer, rather than having it be lost forever. But I would put it to, to the Parliament that it would be a matter for the Parliament to decide on which of those two options would be preferable as a matter of policy. But let's have one or the other. Presumably, Mr Watterson, you would prefer to see them recycled and transferred, if, if that was... Yeah, I mean, we need case. clarification on it, yeah. OK. Thanks very okay. much, Can you... Um, Claire Adamson, please. Thank you, Convener. Um, could I go back to the issue of um, the proposal for a provisional site-only licence? You said that that would be to give um, a, a degree of um, confidence to investors that there would be a licence on the premises should, should it go ahead with the, the proposed bill. But in my understanding, the licensing board would have to make their decision on whether or not it was appropriate to give the licence on the final layout of that um, premises and that, that it met all the requirements in terms of licensing. So in terms of it, it isn't really a guarantee that the licensing board will offer a license because they have to make the decision based on the final build. I, I, I'm, I'm kind of like st having difficulty seeing what kind of confidence or help that that would offer going forward. It's a two-stage process. The provisional licence process, as existing, is a two-stage process. So you have the provisional licence granted, but then there is a second process, which is called confirmation. And at that point, the licensing board re effectively revisit the application based on the work having been done and based on environmental health inspecting the premises to make sure that it's compliant in terms of food hygiene. So when a provisional licence is granted, it cannot be traded from until such times as that second process has been gone through. To get, to get the second process confirmed, you have to show the licensing board that you've met all the building regulations and that the premises has been built safely. You have to show the licensing board that you've passed kitchen checks and that your sinks are clean. Um, you also have to tell the licensing board who's going to be the named day-to-day -day manager of the premises. And then you also, if there have been any changes in terms of the layout or so on, you have to, in some cases, vary the provisional licence to show the, the board what the layout would be. So there, there wouldn't be a case that a licensing board would confirm a provisional licence without knowing what the final layout was. That would always, it's part of the existing process, but the, the, the difficulty at the moment is that you can't lodge your application as early as some developers and, and prospective applicants would like because they don't have that final layout. But the final layout will always be known by the licensing board when it gets to confirmation stage. But I, I'm, I'm kind of like... Um having difficulty in, in seeing how a licensing board could even do a provisional licence if they were not able to see, you know, if, if it's you, what you're describing as maybe an empty box, um, how a provisional licence could be granted on that basis when there's well, no, none of these um, uh, provisions, if you like, have been, have been demonstrated to a licensing board. Well, with uh, the 1976 Act, you have 30 years of experience of licensing boards granting site-only provisional licences without that system falling into disrepute. Under the new system, licensing plans, the layout of the premises, are always a fiction with a provisional licence. And this is part of the reason why we're asking for this. It's, it's slightly odd that you have to invent a, a layout simply to get the application lodged when you don't know that that will actually be the final layout. OK. Um, can I go, also go back to the, um, the club issue that was um, um, raised by um, my colleague, um, Mr Buchanan? Um, he said that they don't have to say that they have a, a registered manager for a club when they're, the, the, they're getting the licence approved. Um, do all the other provisions about certificated um, people selling alcohol, do those all still apply to a club? Yes, the staff training regulations do apply, which require anyone involved in the sale or, or, or supply of alcohol to have a minimum two-hour training on various different topics. I think there are 16 in total. Um, so staff members still have to do the training. It's just that they don't have to have a named day-to-day -day manager or 
personal licence holder. Certainly many clubs do have personal licence holders on the books, as it were, but they might not be named on the licence as a day-to-day -day manager of that premises. OK. okay. Thank you. Anne McTaggart, please. Thanks, convener, and morning, panel. We're nearly into afternoon now. Um, could I ask you on the, the bill, the creation of the new... Of, of the offence of supplying alcohol to someone who's under 18. Now, that's obviously changed from what it used to be. Can you inform the committee if, what difficulties you see may well arise from that for, and particularly the, the retailers and the staff? Mr Lee, please. Um, <clears throat> it's a good question. It relates to a big issue for us, which is um, proxy purchase. Unfortunately, there are adults, people over the age of 18, who are willing to buy alcohol um, on behalf of young people. Mm -hmm. um, so generally, we are supportive of the idea of the supply of alcohol to, to young people be, being an offence. But uh, as, you, as you imply, there will always be issues about the, the enforcement of that. Um, it's not an easy one to crack. What I would say is that I think the way to address it is through a kind of multi-agency approach. We are, as I mentioned at the beginning, involved in a project called the East Edinburgh Community Alcohol Partnership, and it's based in Portobello and, and Pierce Hill in Edinburgh. And the idea of that is to look at underage drinking um, specifically and the issue of proxy purchases. And we feel that because retailers have been very successful in implementing the Challenge 25 uh, regime in store, the kind of problem has sort of been shifted out, out with the store. There's very little now that responsible retailers uh, can do uh, on, on, on this problem. So we think we have to bring in police, social services, education, um, the local community generally, uh, to, look at, to look at cracking this problem. And the only way we can do that is by, by establishing things like community alcohol partnerships. And this new offence might be, might, might be part of that. So there will be problems of enforcement, <clears throat> excuse me, but I think the only way that we can really crack that, that problem is by broadening it, looking what happens out store, looking what happens within the wider community and within the home. Um, and that's the only way I think we're really going to address that issue of proxy purchase and really make this new offence workable. Yeah, well, of course, we don't have the same problems with, with proxy purchase, so have some sympathy with convenience stores on that, but um, we certainly support um, the additional new offence regarding the supply of alcohol to children. So uh, the history of our involvement with trying to stop un underage drinking and all the agencies that were involved in, I think, shows that we're, we're determined to try and um, sort that out, but not, I think, not just simply moving it on to, to, to someone else to worry about it. Um, can, I, can I say, Mr Watterson, um, that you're saying that you have no problem with proxy pur purchasing, and I, I realise that um, most of the folk that you're representing are pubs and hotels, etc. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there are situations which I've seen in the past, um, particularly with licensed premises with outdoor areas, where folk have gone into the pub to buy drink for underage folk who are drinking outside of that pub. So I wouldn't go as far as Sorry, to say that yeah, that, that would be that's an not impossibility. It's a problem for us. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, before I bring you back in, that. Anne, I think, Claire, you had a, a, a point here. Oh, it was just really to clarify how this would affect um, premises selling food, if, it, if at all, in terms of um, a, a child who was out with their parents for a meal. Or, and, and actually what the effect would be in a family home for a parent also who, who offered alcohol to, to a young person in the family home um, as part of a meal in, in that sort of social setting. Who wants to pick up on that, gentlemen? Mr McGowan. The, uh, the bill as proposed creates a definition of where this offence would apply, which is public place, so it wouldn't apply to domestic uh, residences. And I think uh, church premises, religious establishments are mentioned there as well. Um, generally, the Institute welcomes this as a tightening up of the, 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 the offences. Um, and I think the issue was here historically that the offence was tied to li being on licensed premises as opposed to outside of licensed premises. And of course, the police have had an issue with that for a number of years. So the Institute certainly welcomes this being tightened up. Anne? No, that's me. I'm finished. Okay, thanks. Um, 
time for me to ask this question, Mr McGowan, uh, and that's whether it's appropriate for a licensing board to consider police intelligence, which has not necessarily been corroborated in any way, and of course spent convictions as part of their investigations into whether an applicant is a fit and proper person. Thank you for that opportunity, uh, convener. Um, I, I should say, as I have done already, that the Institute firmly supports the reintroduction of a fit and proper test. Uh, we very much see it as a good thing uh, for the trade. At the end of the day, I think all of the stakeholders involved in the licensing system want to see alcohol sold and consumed responsibly, and the fit and proper person test would certainly uh, assist that. Um, the concern is that there has been reference to, in assessing whether or not someone is fit and proper, that this would open the door to the use of police intelligence. In other words, um, unknown and unseen evidence as to whether or not a person was unfit. And if I can deal with that point, the, the Institute's position is that there are human rights implications where you have a police letter suggesting that someone should not hold a licence, but they won't tell you why. Uh, and, my, and the Institute's submission that should not be founded upon by a licensing board. The right to a fair trial, uh, human rights implications certainly apply in those circumstances. Now, the police have got very good reasons why they may not be able to introduce certain intelligence. Perhaps there's ongoing investigations. Perhaps there, are under, there is undercover work going on. And that's the reason why they can't produce that level of detail. But the Institute's position would be that it's, it's not correct to point a finger at someone and say, we don't want you to get a licence, but we're not telling you why. Licensing boards can't really deal with that type of situation. It's perfectly open, I would say, at the moment to the police to endeavour to introduce police intelligence. I've certainly, in my other capacity as a private practice solicitor, appeared in hearings where intelligence of that sort has been led. But I have to say that licensing boards find it very difficult to respond to deal to that level of detail uh, because there is no detail. And uh, I would imagine that licensing boards would be wary of finding unfitness in these circumstances uh, because they will be aware that applicants who have had licenses refused on those grounds would probably run off to the sheriff with an appeal. And my perception would be that a sheriff would not uh, take the, the, um, the, the, the police intelligence or should say that the licensing board should not have taken that police intelligence into account. Perception there, would it? Perception. Your yes, perception well, well, of what a sheriff would do. Yes, indeed. Uh, very often the police will have very legitimate concerns about an applicant. And it may well be that that applicant is perhaps, for example, <coughs> someone who is involved in serious and organised crime. But even in those circumstances, if the evidence is not before the person and the person is not aware of what the charges against him are, how legitimately can a licensing board find that he is unfit without knowing what that evidence is? So, playing devil's advocate here, um, if a, a person within a licensing board um, was deemed um, to, to be able to get more information round about intelligence, as certain members of police boards have been able to in the past, would you say that that would maybe be a way around that? Well, not if the applicant is not made aware of it. Um, certainly, it should not be appropriate for licensing board members to be given evidence that no one else has sight of, and certainly not the, certainly not the applicant. Um, and I think that we have accepted that licensing decisions should be made by licensing authorities and not by the police. And there is a concern that in one of the proposals that's been mentioned, not in this bill, but by, by other parties, that you should have a police intelligence commissioner uh, sat on licensing boards, uh, pointing the finger as necessary, but without giving any further information, would be something that the Institute would firmly be opposed to. OK, can, can I ask you then, because we've concentrated on the intelligence aspect of it, do you differentiate between intelligence and spent convictions? Yes, there is a separate point to be made about, about spent convictions. First of all, spent convictions are not currently allowed to be considered by licensing boards at all. Um, I would think that the Parliament would have to take evidence from Police Scotland that the licence trade has is is fallen into disrepute as a result of not being able to consider spent convictions before proceed, proceeding to enact uh, the, the, uh, the allowance of licensing boards to consider uh, 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 spent convictions. Um, 
the, re the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act is there to allow people to move on with their lives. And I think that that is something which has to be borne in mind. And there is a difference between certain categories of employment which are not covered by the Rehabilitation of Offenders, such as other licences, uh, i.e. taxi drivers, private hire drivers, are not entitled to not disclose their spent convictions. But in my, in my mind, certainly, there is a difference between a taxi driver who is in an enclosed space with an individual and someone working behind a bar in a public place. And I think that there are different considerations in relation to public protection uh, on that basis. Busy bar, and there is only the bar person and maybe one other, other person at a particular point in time. What I would say to that point is that if there is evidence that the inability to refer to spent convictions has brought the system into disrepute, I am not aware of it. Gentlemen, do you have anything else to add to this before I bring in Mr Wilson? Yeah, well, well we sort of take a, a middle view there. We believe that, depending on the severity of the crime, the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act should not apply. So the police and licensing boards would decide, depending on the severity of the crime, whether it should... I mean, we, we're of the opinion that to hold a, a licence is a privilege. The, the, the premises manager and personal licence holders are the most important people involved in the whole process. They're the ones standing there selling, selling alcohol in whichever, in whichever outlet it's in. And we welcome the reintroduction of fit and proper. I think we should learn from 76, when there was endless debates about what fit and proper learned, what fit and proper meant. And it should be defined what, clearly what, what we actually mean by that. And if that takes into account training, age, the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act and, and some other elements, then I think that, that, will, that will help us. But just to say fit and proper at the discretion of everybody caused real problems after 76. Mr Lee, do you have anything to Just to say, Convener, we have no real problems with the reintroduction of, of the test, but we do feel that applicants should be able to see any evidence that's, that's presented uh, potentially against them. Mr Wilson. Thank you, Convener. Just in Mr McGowan, just to tease out the issue about the police information provided to boards, licensing boards. My understanding, and you can correct us if I'm wrong, is that at the end of the day, it's up to the board to decide whether or not to grant a licence. It's not up to the police. So any information that's provided by the police to a board in relation to an applicant, the board at the present time, and I, as I understand it in future, would be able to note the information, whether that be in, in relation to hard evidence and whether that be spent convictions or other uh, issues. Uh, and it would really be down to discretion of the board whether or not they granted the licence. Is that, not, is that not the case? Mr McGowan. It's certainly down to the licensing board to make the decision and they have the ultimate discretion as to whether to grant the licence or not. In a practical situation, if you're before a licensing board and the police say, we don't like this guy, is that going to prejudice the licensing board without knowing what the full details of that information is? And I think that impinges upon the right to a fair trial. See, I'm, I'm equated to other issues such as planning, where a number of organisations go along no national organisations go along to planning committees and say, well, we don't like this application, uh, therefore we are asking you to reject the planning application. I just equate that to the licensing board, where the police and others can go along to a licensing board and say, well, we are not happy with this applicant. The intelligence or whatever it may be, you know, the spent convictions, and I think there are issues about what, what you term as a spent conviction, for somebody applying for a licence, but ultimately the board has, as you've said yourself, final discretion on whether or not to grant a licence to whoever makes an application for a licence. That, that's certainly the case. The licensing board has the ultimate discretion, but I, I reiterate that the Institute's position is that there is a human right dimension to the reference to police intelligence. Um, the, the position would be that, that we do not believe it's correct for um, an applicant to be faced with an allegation which is not substantiated or evidenced and have to uh, have their prospective livelihood uh, in balance um, at, at one of these hearings without knowing what that evidence is. Just tease this further. Yeah, yeah. Convener, sorry. 
what happens if police intelligence goes to the licensing board and says, we suspect this person is involved in serious and organised crime. The licence that they're... And it goes back to the point I raised earlier about the licence application is being made by someone on behalf of someone who, is, who owns the premises, is the landlord, and the police do have the, the real evidence to say that the individual is involved in serious and organised crime and the person that's making the application for the licence could be accused of being a front person. Patsy. Well, Patsy, front person for someone who is involved in serious and organised crime and is effectively using criminal activities to fund the premises that somebody else applies for a licence for. Licensing uh, boards will hear any evidence and place such weight as they deem uh, appropriate on evidence that's presented to them. But the evidence has to be sufficient and it has to be probative. And if, it is, if it's neither of those things, then the decision could be overturned on appeal. This happened recently in Aberdeen with a case called Ask Entertainments Limited versus Aberdeen Licensing Board, where um, a licensee had his licence revoked because of police information which was presented to the Aberdeen Board that a, a director of the licence holding company was connected to or involved with serious and organised crime and the licence was revoked. The Aberdeen Sheriff Court overturned that decision on appeal because of the lack of sufficiency and probativity of the evidence which the police had presented. And that's the current state of play in terms of the case law uh, under the Act. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Mr McGowan, you've offered um, supplementary submission uh, covering transfer provisions, provisional licences uh, and surrender of, of licences. Um, the committee would be grateful for that, and would it be possible to get that before Christmas? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Consider uh, that present. Uh, uh, <laughs> me <laughs> Merry Christmas, Mr McGowan. Uh, Alec Rowley, please. Just really to follow up on that, convener, I mean, Mr McGowan has set out these three areas where, where he believes that, that we should be looking further. Can I just ask the panel, was there any other areas within the alcohol licensing um, mm -hmm. where there is um, an opportunity to to bring forward improvements that would, would make licensing more business friendly and support business more? Is there any other areas to those that you've, you've set out there? Let's go with Mr Lee first, if you have anything. Um, consistency from boards would be, would be very helpful. Um, that's one of the main issues that our, that our members face. Um, I know this is unlikely to happen, but um, uh, the Scottish Government is looking at extending something called primary authority and partnerships, whereby businesses which operate across more than one local authority area can actually form a partnership with a single uh, local authority uh, in terms of compliance, enforcement, inspection and so on. Uh, I know this is highly unlikely, but if in the future we were able to do that with alcohol licensing, uh, that would be hugely beneficial to our members. So I think um, an overall lack of consistency from boards is, is an ongoing um, issue for our members. Watterson, please. Yeah, I think that I would agree with that. It's this this problem that we've always had since the formation of, of licensing boards and inconsistency sometimes at, at one board um, has raised its head on, on numerous occasions. So some form of consistency amongst local licensing boards I think would be, be really helpful to us. Thank you. Mr McGowan, please. I'm going to restrict myself to one, one request, uh, committee personal licences. Some of the committee members may have seen that in the last week. Somewhere in the region of approaching 10,000 personal licences have been revoked as a result of failures in connection with training and notification of training to licensing boards. When you find yourself in a position that approaching 10,000 people have their licence revoked, there must be something wrong somewhere. Now, this bill seeks to address this. Clause 57 of the bill <clears throat> seeks to address this issue by removing what I'm going to refer to as the five-year ban on personal licensees who have had their licences revoked in these circumstances. But the bill may not come into play and into effect, I should say, for some time. <laughs> and I think it's incumbent upon me to ask the Parliament to consider emergency legislation in relation to this particular point to allow those 10,000 people to reapply for a personal licence. 
rather than having to wait for the Act to come into force in perhaps a, a, a year's time uh, or so. Again, happy to supplement that by way of written submission to the committee. But 10,000 people, um, very large section of the licensed trade community, and it would be great if the Parliament could, could look, at, look at that to see if that amendment could be brought back in. Perhaps not to uh, restore those licences, because they have been lost by the licence holders' own lack of uh, um, notifying the board, but the five-year ban does seem pretty draconian. Mr McGowan, emergency legislation is not in the gift of this committee. It is a matter for government uh, alone. Only they can introduce it. Um, Claire Adamson, please. Uh, so just, Mr. McGowan, I am um, sorry I am very new to this committee. Our first meeting was last week, so I am trying to get up to speed. Can, can you tell me how many personal licences there are in Scotland at the moment, just to get understand the scale of the 10,000? I would only be able to give you an estimate because there is no national database, but estimates are between 35 and 40,000 personal licence holders across the whole of Scotland. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the figures that we know about in terms of these revocations, at the moment, at the last count was 7,600, but there are a number of licensing boards that have not given out the figures yet, and we anticipate that it could rise to 10 or perhaps even more, 10,000 so, or more. Um, obviously, there is there's a lot of... Um you know, both in the on and off trade retail, there's a lot of people who, who will do bar work as a temporary time with their students if they're younger um, to supplement, you know, initial jobs and things. It, 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 is there any indication of how, how much of that is just people have, have lapsed in that role? There will certainly be a, a percentage of the 10,000 that I've mentioned who have left the trade. Um, in, in some circumstances, the licensee will have died. You know, there, there will always be some of those uh, uh, factors involved. But even if you take into account people who have left the trade are not interested in having their licence for whatever reason. There is still a very, very large number of pe people out there who, effectively, as a result of an administrative oversight, have lost their licence. Is that administrative oversight on their part or the part of the yeah, board? Well, well, yes, it is an administrative oversight on their part. The duty to undertake a refresher course within a set period and then notify that they've done that to the licensing well, board. I, I, I'm going to put a stop to this because at the end of the day, you know, this is um, a bit out with the scope of what we're scrutinising here um, because this is a call for uh, uh, emergency uh, legislation and I think you're right to point out about uh, whose responsibility this actually is. Alec, could you finish? Fine. OK. Um, thank you. Uh, finally, um, in terms of uh, the many... Uh, notes that we have uh, on this uh, particular subject. Uh, there's one point uh, that sticks out for me in terms of the briefings that we've had, uh, and I've never served in a licensing board, uh, I have to say. Uh, and that point is licensing boards must hold their meetings in public, except that they are allowed to conduct deliberations in a point in private before making a decision in public. Now, over the years, um, I've had a, a lot of allegations about what goes on um, in the back room uh, from uh, my own neck of the woods and also from elsewhere. Do you have any comment on the behaviours, the perceptions there are um, about certain aspects of, uh, of these bits and pieces that are held in private? Mr McGowan. Um, <clears throat> I've appeared before a great number of licensing boards in Scotland, and some of them uh, do retire to consider applications before giving a decision, and yet others will do all of their discussions out in public. As a personal preference, I think that all of the debates and discussions should be held in public, and that's my personal view, not the view of the Institute, because I've not canvassed the members' views on that particular point. Um, so it's a personal view only. I would say that it's uh, preferable that um, applicants can see what the issues are and what the issues that the board members feel are, um, rather than have them uh, retire to consider uh, in private. Mr Waterson. Well, yes, I would agree with that. However, I think sometimes I have seen boards with very controversial um, applications before them not retire and immediately vote on them without any discussion at all. You know, maybe look at each other and hands go up, which means that probably it might have been discussed before the meeting. 
Um, so I, I certainly agree that. Uh, so that works the opposite way around. That they, they're having no, no well, discussions afterwards. Uh, you, you talked about uh, discussions beforehand. What about pre-meetings? Because again, there's been allegations of pre-meetings in certain yeah. areas. Absolutely. I think what Stephen's saying, right, that any discussion should be held in public. OK. Mr. Mr Lee, do you have a view on that? We would just always ask for the maximum amount of openness and transparency. Um, convener, I think um, the Edinburgh Licensing Forum has tr is trying to move the board in the direction of podcasting and webcasting all of their all of the discussions, so that may be a, web, a way forward. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank you, gentlemen, very much for your evidence today. And I suspend this meeting and we move into private session. <laughs>